Let us pray. Artist of souls, you sculpted a people for yourself out of the rocks of wilderness and fasting. Help us as we take up your invitation to prayer and simplicity, that the discipline of these 40 days of Lent may sharpen our hunger for the feast of your holy friendship and whet our thirst for the living water you offer through Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who were persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you.
Join with me in today's prayer of confession. Almighty and most merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But you, O Lord, Do have mercy upon us. Spare those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful God, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Let us continue in a moment of silent confession. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God. I need to take a deep breath. <laughs> um, many of you know that our daughter, Wendy, died in a car accident in June of 1998. My testimony today centers around this very difficult time in Benny's and my life. And I say this, though, to give God the glory. In Romans 8, 28, it reads, And we know that in all things, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. My understanding of Romans 8.28 is that God is redeeming all things. He is making all things new. God is taking all of creation, even the broken stuff, and renewing and redeeming it. Before this tragedy, I was a Sunday-going Christian. I was involved in many aspects of the church, such as vacation Bible school, teaching a senior and adult Sunday school class, and supporting our children's activities in the church. Now, we weren't here at this church at that time, but I did not have a relationship with Christ. I was more of a Martha than a Mary. You know that story. Martha always wanted to take care of everything, get everything in order, And then Mary was the one that wanted to spend time with Jesus. I wanted to grow, but I just didn't feel like I could ask questions. If I did, I was afraid that people would think that my faith was weak or questionable. And then that day came. It was June the 12th, early that morning. Two Roanoke County officers came to our door Benny was already at work, and it was the first day of my summer break. Can you can you hear me? Are you? Hmm. Um, one of the officers asked me if we had a daughter, Wendy Basham. Well, right away I knew something was wrong, and I remember sitting on that couch, not knowing what to do. I had no idea I was lost. Then one of the officers asked me if if there was someone I could call. And of course it was Benny. Well, difficult weeks followed. Benny went back to work dealing with his own grief. And here I was. I actually don't remember a lot about that summer. But school would be starting back in August. And you know, I never thought about not teaching. It just did not enter my mind. Um, Ms. Walton, the principal at that time, told me later that the school had received many calls asking if I was going to be able to return. And I did. 
but only by the grace of God and with the support of those wonderful teachers across the street and parents who supported me through their own faith. And they walked with me just as Christ walked with me. There were so many times that God let me know that he was there. Whether it was a book that someone had sent me, whether it was scripture that popped up, whether it was one of Wendy's that came to visit and share a story that I never knew about. <laughs> um, even a waitress that wore a little angel pin. And you know, when I look back, I realized that Ms. Walton was really taking a chance on me. Most people I would have thought would have encouraged me to stay at home, to take the time off. But she left it up to me, and with the support of the school, I was able to do it. I remember that first day of school, greeting my new fifth graders. Ann Peters, the count guidance counselor, was there with me, and we had talked about doing this earlier. Um, all of the community knew about Wendy's death, and I couldn't pretend that nothing hadn't happened. I showed them pictures of Wendy and Bob, and I talked about their lives and, and how I knew them and how they were growing up. Uh, I also talked about the grief that I was experiencing and shared with them that there may be times when I would be very sad, um, but that I was okay and that Ms. Peters would stand, would fill in for me if I needed her. Well, this opened up a whole new dialogue with the kids. A child talked about her dog dying and what that was like for her. Another child shared her anger about not being able to see her grandmother who was dying of cancer. And there were so many, many other stories. And I also remember one of my students, his name was Sean, and he was like my constant lookout. If he saw me getting sad or um, if it was, wasn't the best time, he would come up to me and he would say, Miss Basham, do you need a tissue? <laughs> you know? So he was just, even the day that the kids graduated, we were walking down the hall, headed to the gym for the graduation ceremony. And as we were walking down, you know, in our pomp and circumstance, and um, he looked at me as we were walking and he said, Miss Basham, this is hard on you, isn't it? You know, it's amazing how kids know, know what's going on. You can't fool them. And to top everything off, the Mount Pleasant community rallied together to raise money through car washes, bake sales, and even a talent show to sponsor a, co a scholarship in Wendy's name through the Roanoke County Educational Association, Foundation rather. And it was for anyone who attended Mount Pleasant and also William Byrd. But do you know what made it even more special for me? was that those children that had received that scholarship, I had taught, because they had been at Mount Pleasant. In closing, Romans 8.28 reminded me and reminds all of us that all things will be worked out for our good. God is making things, all things new. God is making things all things new. Thank you. Matthew 6, 1, 8, 16, 18. Today we read from chapter 6 of Matthew. The part of the Bible that we call the Sermon on the Mount. Listen now to those challenge the words of Jesus. Listen for God's word to the church. Be aware and practice your critique before others in order to be seen by them. For them you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whatever you give arms, do not sound the trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in synagogue and in the streets, so that we may be praised by others. Surely I tell you, I have received their reward. But when you give arms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing 
so that your owners may be done in secret and your father who seek, sees in secret will reward you. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the church corner so they might be seen by others. Truly I tell you, I have received their reward. But whatever you may pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will warn you when you are praying. Do not give up empty praise as Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of the word, many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And whenever you fast, do not look dismayed like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their face. So as you to show others that they are fasting, truly I tell you that you have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, and so that the fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. We give thanks to God for the gift of his word. It's a joy to welcome all of you as we come together in worship today. And what a cleansing I felt during that time of meditation and singing and testimony and scripture. Um, it's already been a great time of refreshment. I would remind all of you to find the Welcome Connect cards, the yellow cards that are in front of you. Be sure and use those for your, for your uh, registering your attendance and also lifting up your praises and your prayers on the back of the card and just leave the card um, on the seat before you leave. For those who are worshiping with us online, we hope you feel the presence of God during this time as well too. Maybe you can take time to register your attendance as well. Leave a comment. Let us know you're here. Um, it's good to hear from you. And um, also pass along any prayer requests that you might have. Today we continue our Lenten journey through the Sermon on the Mount. We've been challenged so much. We looked at the Beatitudes in detail and have been using those as our responsive reading. It's good to hear those words of the Beatitudes. Last week we had some really challenging teachings of Jesus talking about loving your enemy, turning the other cheek, the the challenging ways that we're called to interact to people. And then in chapter 6, as you heard Barbara read a moment ago, we kind of go a new direction now. And the, the chapter in the book was titled, I believe, Your Secret Life. And it's talking about um, what's going on inside. What's going on inside? What happens between us and Jesus and how we nurture that in order to grow in him. I hope you have the opportunity to read the chapter in McLaurin's book. Uh, I think last week I talked about the fact that I sort of go my own direction. As I read the chapter for this week, I kept thinking, oh my goodness, I could spend a long, long time on each paragraph because there was so much good stuff reminding us what it's like to have our daily time with Jesus. So I'll, I'll allude to that a little bit, but I'll also share some things that I learned in the prayer school I went to a couple of weeks ago as well that I'm currently growing with myself there. Jesus talks about not practicing your faith and piety before others. It's really ironic that we do that during Lent, a time that we talk about really having um, a, a discipline to our spiritual life. And that can easily turn into a badge of pride. Some traditions read that very scripture on Ash Wednesday, talking about washing your face. And then we leave the church with a mark of ash on our head. I've heard pastors discuss, you know, well, when you leave the church on Ash Wednesday, do you immediately go to the restroom and clean up so that nobody is looking at you? I decided not to do that this year. I actually, I told some of you I went to a 7 a.m. Ash Wednesday service at another church. By the time I got here, my cross had sort of turned into the number four because I accidentally rubbed my head a couple of times there. But I had two good conversations with people 
that very morning that never would have happened if there had not been a mark of ash upon my head. They knew what it was, but they had forgotten that it was Ash Wednesday, and it was a reminder to them. And it led to some important conversations. But on the whole, Jesus is reminding us that we really need to focus on our personal relationship with God without any effort to impress other people. He even says, go into your closet and pray. Have you ever prayed in a closet? That'd be kind of interesting, wouldn't it? I could probably do that now because after all these years, we have a pretty good sized closet. You know, I could, I could set up a little corner and it wouldn't, wouldn't be cramped at all. But let me tell you, I've lived in some houses where I don't think I would have even fit in the closet. Or my grandma's house. It didn't have closets. Did you ever see one of those old houses that just had standing cabinets there? She called it a shift rope. I, I never knew what that was. I finally figured out how to spell it. It was, it was a standing piece of furniture that you used instead of a closet there. Go into your closet and pray. What was Jesus thinking about? Just think about that for a minute, Sophia. What did Jesus mean by going into your closet and praying? He didn't mean you always have to go into a closet as such. But he was reminding us of the importance of withdrawing. There's an amazing quote from our chapter in McLaurin this week. I want to highlight it. If you want to see change in the outside world, the first step is to withdraw into your inner world. I like the way Jenny talked about Martha and Mary. I didn't even think about that connection there, but it really fits with exactly what we're talking about this week, that both Martha and Mary knew part of the story, if you will. Martha was, let's go out and do something. Mary was like, let's hold back and be with Jesus. McLaurin wrote a little further from what's found in the chapter in the book and talked about the fact that there's always a tension in Christianity between what he called the activist and the contemplative. Sorry to use big words there, but I'll explain what it means. Activists are people who approach their faith in terms of let's go out and change the world. Contemplatives are a little more withdrawn. And they're saying, we need to withdraw from the world and be with Jesus. And I think McLaurin would remind us that that doesn't have to be an either or. Maybe the world needs Martha's and Mary's, and maybe there's a little bit of Martha and Mary in each of us that can be held in balance. And think about that when you hear that quote again. If you want to see change in the outside world, the first step is to withdraw into your inner world. It's like filling up our gas tank, if you will. We're not going to put along very far in that car, if we don't stop and fill the tank. And that costs a little money these days, doesn't it, there? We're not going to get very far in our effort to make the world a better place if we're not being filled. Now that leads me to the prayer school that I, I went to and I had an opportunity to do that right before Ash Wednesday. It was an online prayer school and it gave us a very, some very specific challenges about prayer. And Brian Zond, who puts on the prayer school, had a quote that he kept repeating over and over again. I could tell it was important. I want to get it exactly right. He said, the primary purpose of prayer is not to get God to do what we think God ought to do, but to be properly formed. You ever go into a Sonic where you drive up, you pull up, you push the button, and you place your order there, and hopefully the bag comes out a little later that it has what you ordered. Some of us are a little bit like Sonic when we pray. We pull up to God, we press the button, and we say, Dear God, I figured out what you need to do. Don't you know God just sort of chuckles at us sometimes? I'm so proud of you, Robert. You figured out what I need to do. Oh, my. You know, God is incredibly patient with our prayers sometimes. But prayer is not like placing your order at the fast food place on the speaker there at the Sonic. 
The primary purpose of prayer is not to get God to do what we think God ought to do, but to be properly formed. What does that mean? That means in order to be shaped into world changers, in order to be, to be shaped into Christian soldiers, we need that time with him. And Jesus could be no better example because just think, here's the son of God. If anybody was close to God, it was Jesus. But Jesus had that rhythm between intense engagement with the world and the crowds and the powers and the bad folks and withdrawing to be alone with his father. If Jesus needed to withdraw to be alone with his father, to go to his closet or to his mountaintop, he's not telling us that to do anything other than what he himself needed to do. So that, that makes sense? Am I, am I connecting here that, that, that Jesus, in order to really advance into a world with the power of God, also had to retreat? We need to advance, yes, but we also need retreat. The primary purpose of prayer is not to get God to do what we think God ought to do. Now, I'm grateful that God is so tolerant that when, that, when my prayer sounds like that, he still listens. Amen. But I want my prayer, I want my prayer life to grow in maturity. I want to do it more and more his way. And for many of us, Methodists especially, that probably means we need a little more Mary and a little less Martha. You know, um, I remember the story of um, children who were asked to bring a symbol of their religion for show and tell. And a little Jewish fellow brought a prayer cap and says, my daddy puts this cap on when he says his daily prayer. A little Catholic girl brought a rosary and said, my grandma holds these rosary beads as she says her daily prayer. And the little Methodist kid said, this is a casserole dish. This is what we do. Well, we are a little bit like Martha's, you know. There's a casserole for every need, is there not, you know? <clears throat> but sometimes we need to stop. Sometimes we need to stop and just connect with him. I'll be honest, it's been a challenge doing this prayer school thing. Because Brian Zahn, well, it's, in one way it's not a challenge because he tells you exactly what to do. You don't have to make it up. It's 80% laid out there for you. It takes about 25 minutes a day, at least. I thought, can I do that? You know what he said? He said, start this on Ash Wednesday and don't come up for air until after Easter. Do not evaluate it. Do not say this is boring. Do not say this is working. Do not say this is not working. The day after Easter, then you can look at it and say, was it worth the time? So I'm going through it. I'm going through it myself and trying to learn some things about shaping my life in such a way. We started with a great old song, Take Time to Be Holy. That's a great song. It's just full of very simple reminders, but it's also a reminder, it takes time. It takes time to grow in the holiness of God. We like instant, don't we? We like instant. We like fast. The faster, the better. You know, and prayer is maybe a little bit more like a crock pot and less like a microwave. You know, crock pot can do things a microwave can't, right? You know, slow cooking, oh my goodness. Even the toughest old meat can become fork tender with a little time in the crock pot. Would you dare try that in a microwave? It'd be a mess. It might be edible, but barely. There's some things that happen when you take time. It takes time to grow in the holiness of God. Speak off with thy Lord. Our song talked about spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. That's your prayer closet. That's what works. That's finding what works for you and just doing it. 
Just do it. Today I want to share some simple steps that may be helpful to you. And there's a place in your bulletin to write these down. These really are not complicated. They are pretty simple. And I hope by the time we finish today that maybe out of that list of six, you'll at least see two or three that you can say, hey, I can start on this pretty soon this week. Number one, and this one's really important, find your rhythm. Find your rhythm. Now, I don't mean snapping your fingers. I don't mean clapping your hands. Not that kind of rhythm, but I'm meaning what works for you in your daily flow. There's something about coming together as the people of God that we are in a weekly rhythm. We know when Sunday morning rolls around, we know what to do. But as we think about spending much time in secret with Jesus alone, we're probably going to be talking about a daily rhythm. And this is where we are all wired differently. I'm not going to tell you to spend 25 minutes a day between now and Easter Sunday. Uh, but I am going to challenge you to spend some time each day between now and Easter Sunday. For some people, that will mean first thing in the morning. Maybe that describes you, that before the work day gets crazy, you know, you can find your Jesus time. For some of you, you may be more of a night owl. It may work for you to end the day with some quality time with Jesus. And then there may be some of you that kind of need to be like a monk or a nun. You know, the, the bell would ring in the monastery and they would come to the chapel and that would happen several times a day. Some people even have their little um, cell phone program at certain times to say, hey, stop what you're doing. And maybe there's some moments during the day. Or your days may be different enough that you know every day is going to be different. That's kind of the way mine has been. It's not a particular hour of the day, but I have found the middle of the day working better for me to carve out that time to be with God. Find your rhythm. That has to do with the time. It also has to do with the place. Now the truth is, God will hear you at any time, correct? God will hear you at any place, correct? But we often do better with a rhythm to mark a time or to mark a place. Place can even be more important than time because it can help us to withdraw. Maybe like Jesus, you want to go up the mountain. Maybe you want to get in your car and go up to Mill Mountain every day at 12 o'clock noon. Probably not. Probably might have a hard time making time for that. But there might be a, clo a prayer closet that works for you. Maybe in your house or maybe outdoors. A place that becomes kind of holy for you as you pull away and connect. Find your rhythm. That one's really important. Now starting with the next one, I am going to say it's really important that these are not rules. These are not rules. These are not things you have to do. These are some things that the prayer school encouraged me to do. So there's some things I am working with right now. But use it or lose it. Don't, don't worry about it too much. Having said that, number two was a little bit of a challenge. Pray out loud. Pray out loud. I heard a little presentation by another um, couple not too long ago that talked about the fact that the vast majority of, uh, majority of us pray in our head. I know I always kind of did. If I went to prayer time, I just kind of, I would think my prayers. And you know what? That is just fine. That is just fine to think your prayers. But this particular form that we were using as a result of the prayer school, the big chunk of it was out loud. And honestly, the big chunk of it was provided. I didn't have to think up the content. For example, one thing I'm doing, I'm doing the Beatitudes every day. I'm doing the 23rd Psalm every day. I'm doing the Apostles' Creed every day. If you see me on the greenway with a little cheat sheet talking to myself, don't call the authorities. 
I'm just doing my little thing every day. This is kind of new to me. But if the primary purpose of prayer is to get God to do what I want, then I don't have to go through all that. But if the primary purpose of prayer is my formation, again, it's kind of like a crock pot. It's kind of, hopefully not crack pot, crock pot. <laughs> hopefully being surrounded by the sweetness and goodness of God and using the words that others have used for centuries to invade my soul and to settle my soul and to shape me so that when I get to that time of prayer that I need to tell God what's on my mind, it might come out different because I've just spent some time with him. I decided this week, we've done it a little bit, to, to leave some of the, the prayers that we're using in worship service to have them printed out for you so you can, you can take that home and, and maybe your printed bulletin can be a resource to you during the week as well. Some of the prayers that we have in here, there's a prayer for the week with a Lenten theme. There's the Beatitudes, all the blessed. There's the prayer of confession. Make that your prayer this week. Say it out loud. Say it out loud. Make that part of your prayer time before you go to God with the things that are on your heart. Think about praying out loud. Number three. I learned this one a long time ago, and I, I kind of vacillate between doing it well. Pray with a pencil. Have you ever heard that? How do you pray with a pencil? Do you poke somebody with it, or what? Do you poke yourself with it? No, what that means is, in your prayer time, have some paper and something to write with handy. So you might be meditating on a few verses from the Bible, and something crosses your mind. Write it down. Then tomorrow, go back and look at it. You don't have to do this all the time, but this is part of my, this is something I was already doing before the, before the prayer school, is to, to write out some words every day in my Moravian prayer journal, um, not just to read what was on there. It's real short. It doesn't take 25 minutes. It takes two minutes, but I would write some things down. Writing things down actually connects deeper in our soul than just thinking it. Did you know that? This is kind of not related, but I heard somebody uh, talking about for people who are public speakers and have to do a lot of memorization, that not just reading it out loud, but writing it down has a whole different effect in your body. It sort of places it there, maybe with a little super glue there, when you actually write something down. There's something, and, and it's probably better to write than to type, but if you want to type, that's okay. Um, something about that, that hand and eye and connection, those words will come alive for you. So pray with a pencil. Here's one that I've been doing ever since Ash Wednesday. Pray through the Psalms. This was very easy. Well, almost very easy. And that is just take a psalm a day, start with Psalm 1, and say that psalm out loud as part of your daily prayer time. That was pretty easy because all you need is a bookmark. You can remember where you left off. I said it's almost easy because when you get to Psalm 119, there's 176 verses. And you can bite off the big one and you can do the whole thing. Or maybe you'll want to split that one up there. and That one could last a while. Psalm 119 is just amazing. But most of the Psalms um, really are such a valuable resource to, to, me, to you. Let me find out what I, tell you what I've already found out. So... Um, I haven't yet done my psalm for today yet, so we've had 12 days, 11 days of Lent, because March 2nd was Ash Wednesday. So, so I've done the first 11 psalms, one psalm a day out loud. And what I've noticed is that the most memorable psalms, the ones we love the most, are so positive. But the other psalms are filled with people complaining. <laughs> Um, not fussing at God, but fussing about the world, fussing about injustice, fussing about wicked people. You know, if you go through the first 11 Psalms, I don't know if I can say this, should I? Yeah. If you go through the first 11 Psalms, you're going to see Vladimir Putin in about eight of them, I'll tell you, because it, it, it's just talking about people who are, you know, off the deep end, and you're commending that to God. 
I sometimes forget about that because I get stuck on Psalm 90 and Psalm 100 and Psalm 23, and they're so beautiful and they're so peaceful and just kind of calm me down. But there's a, there's a lot of stir in the pot in the Psalms. It will help you articulate your prayer, and it's so easy to do, except for Psalm 119. But the other 149 of them are pretty easy. That can be a resource for you. So start today with Psalm 1. Here's one I had never heard before. Pray the Lord's Prayer twice. What? I'm going to show you what that's like a little bit later. So I'm not even going to go into it now. But for some reason, he, Brian Zahn gave that as a little challenge, to pray the Lord's Prayer twice. And what it is, is you pray through once straight, and you pray it through a second time, adding some personal expressions along the way. So I'll, I'm just kind of going to model that without notes when we get to the end of our service with the Lord's Prayer. We're going to pray it together, and then I'm going to do it twice, sort of like I've been doing it out loud for the last 11 days. Well, number two, three, four, and five on this list are entirely optional. You don't have to do this. These are just some simple things you can do to help get you started. But number six, I think, is a must, and that is be patient. Be patient. I think that's why Brian Zahn said, do this until Easter and then evaluate. Because, as he put it, it's kind of like getting a new pair of hiking boots. If you get a new pair of hiking boots and you go out and walk for five minutes, you're going to say, I like my old hiking boots better. You know, old shoes and old boots always feel better than new ones, right? Why is that? You have to break them in, exactly, exactly. It's, it's like learning something new. It's like getting accustomed to that. So I'm on day 11 out of 46, so, you know, it's been kind of different. But it's a way to challenge me to, to structure my day a little bit different, to be able to do like the song says, take it to the Lord in prayer, spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By the day after Easter, I'll be ready to decide if I want to spend a little time talking to y'all about what this has been like and maybe pass it along to you. But I need to work with it for about 35 more days before I see kind of how this is working for me. There's one more little piece to that. And I, I said 80 to 90 percent of the 25 minutes is pretty structured. There's a lot of repetition. Most of it is the same one day after the next. But the heart, the middle of the time, is what he calls sitting with Jesus. And he said that usually has no words at all. And what he said, I, I, I kind of have to go through the preparation to get to the point where then I can move beyond the words. That's ultimate Mary and no Martha, just sitting with Jesus. And I've got, to lo I've got a lot to learn about that. And I'm, I'm working with that. But, but one thing he suggested is that maybe there's some things that can bring you beyond words. Um, our Catholic friends have the rosary. I've heard of other people come up with prayer beads and they just kind of hold the bead and repeat some phrases in their mind. But art sometimes does that as well. Our Greek Orthodox friends, maybe you've heard, have part of their spirituality is the icon. Now, if Methodists look at a Greek icon, we say, well, that's a sweet little painting. And our Greek friends just say, oh, you dumb Methodists, that is not a sweet little painting. That's a door to the divine. And so, this is hard for us. The, the visual becomes a way of getting past the words for our Greek Christian friends. And maybe there's some ways that, that we can um, kind of resonate with art, maybe, maybe music. One of the things I've been doing is, is kind of just hum some songs and not just say the words of the song. Just hum the songs and think about the presence of Jesus. Another thing to do is to visualize your mess. 
What is the mess that's on your heart today? And then just see Jesus in that mess. And just wait. Just wait. Take time to be holy. It's not going to happen in five seconds. But if you spend time with visualizing your mess and then seeing Jesus in your mess, if you do that enough, something's going to happen. Our prayer song today is None But Jesus. I invite you just to listen or to hum. Yeah.
Now, as our Savior has taught us, together let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God, I thank you for the glory of your name, and I praise you. And Lord, I pray that these psalms, and these scriptures, and these prayers would keep me focused on your name, to keep your name not only sacred, to not take your name in vain, but to not take your presence in vain, O oh God. Help me to do that. Bless me during the next seven days as I carve out time to structure my day to spend time with your son Jesus. And I pray for each one in this room to honor your name in doing that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, put my will aside for a moment. Help me to seek your will. I thank you for the inbreaking of your kingdom. And Lord, keep me hopeful and keep me faithful enough to be able to see the signs of your inbreaking. This world beats me down so much. This world can drag me down. This world can drag me into being a pessimist. Help me to be a citizen of your kingdom and to proclaim the goodness I see and to, to honor the goodness in others, even in small ways. Give us this day our daily bread. God, I thank you for daily provision. Help me never to take it for granted. For food on the plate, for shelter over my head. And Lord, help me to be satisfied with the simple things in life. And give me a heart for those who struggle for bread. Give me a heart for those who struggle for shelter and help me to share it. Forgive us our trespasses as though we forgive those who trespass against us. God, I thank you so much for your amazing grace. It's so good to know that you love me, that you love us as we are, but don't leave us where we are. But God, sometimes it's hard to forgive others. Sometimes I hold on to things too long. Sometimes I say I forgive, but then I don't forget. Sometimes I hold things over people. Help me to show a measure of the grace to others that you show to me so lavishly. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, help me never to be naive about the evil world in which we live, the, the dangerous paths that are all around us. Help me to look and listen and pay attention to your presence in my heart. To help me choose the wise path. Lord, when you're leading me to stay away, help me to stay away, even if it looks good. Lord, if you're tapping me on the shoulder, saying to go ahead, even if it's a little scary, help me to go ahead. Keep me safe from the evil one and help me to cherish always your protection that you give me. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go back and reread chapter 6 of Matthew this week and, and bring home your bulletin with those six simple steps. See if there's a couple of things you can, you can start with this week. Um, encourage one another. Um, if, if something good happens, tell a friend. If something bad happens, tell a friend. If you, if you, if you kind of get frustrated, tell a friend. Let's learn from each other. Yeah, we need our private prayer closet, but yeah, we need each other as well. Jesus said we come together and pray. What you got, Sophia? Um, my, I usually, my mom has only a two left, two left bedroom house. I was only sleeping on the couch, so I asked my mom to turn one closet into my bedroom. Yeah, it's my mom that comes to my bedroom. Some new closets. Like, have you done that yet, or you're going yeah, to? Yeah, my mom's going to do it. Like, we have closets. Well, you know you can go in your closet and yeah, pray and then change it. I knew a pastor one time, they had way too many kids because he, he married a, a lady with a 
some kids and then had some of his own and they were in a small parsonage. I think they did use a closet too. That can, that can happen. So, so the, the, the Sermon on the Mount has been really interesting because we have these Beatitudes. Last week we kind of got hit over the head. You know, love your enemies, turn the other cheek. Today, a whole different direction. Talking about our alone time, our daily time with God. Next week we're going to get hit over the head again. Don't worry and don't judge. Hmm. That worries me already. I know I shouldn't do that. So, um, some great teaching of Jesus: how to get beyond worrying and how to get beyond judging. So, read ahead as you get ready for next week. We're going to lap over into part of chapter seven next week as we continue this journey. We're going to use our our pilgrim song again uh, with the doxology for our closing. So. Stay Courage for